Hey, good morning. I want to welcome everyone to the Church in the Woods. I'm going to wait just a moment for you guys to sign on. And uh, we're in a different location. Uh, the Church in the Woods is, is hundreds of acres, but uh, we try to go at one spot. But down there in the swamp where my pool pit is, uh, the swamp water has come up, so it's kind of wet. So I'm down here at another spot that we use. Um, while we're waiting for you guys to sign on, the, uh, the message today is the unforgivable. And right now, if you know anyone that you believe they think they're unforgivable. They think that they've got they've gone too far. Someone just kind of give up on themselves. I want you to tag them in this. I want you to share this, message them, tell them to watch this because I'm gonna give you some scripture that's gonna encourage you and them that God has laid on my heart. Before uh, we get started, there's a couple of announcements. I wanna ask all of you to be praying for the revival in the woods. It starts October 14th. It's gonna be in my hometown in Bladenburg at a, a small church called Greater Vision Church. Um, but it's gonna, I really believe God is going to do something special. We have other churches I believe that are getting involved. We're waiting to hear back. Um, it's going to be broadcast live, so you'll be able to join us live on the event or at any of my pages, my page, uh, David Pate or Real World Outdoors. Also, next Saturday, I'll be in Andrew, North Carolina at Piney Grove Chapel Church preaching. It's a uh, community fish fry. So if you live in the Andrew Raleigh area, uh, you're more than welcome to come and uh, if you'll go to my page, you can see some information on that, the location, or message me, and I'll be glad to let you know. Um, it's funny, you know, when you when you think you're going to speak on one particular subject, God um, oftentimes changes what I believe he wants me to speak on, and then I realize it's just what I was really running with, and God says, no, this is what I want you to speak on. So he kind of flipped everything on me this morning, and I want to share this with you today. I'm not even really sure what scripture I'm going to start with, so I think I'm just going to read um, the first part of what I believe he would want me to share. Again, let me know where you're watching from. We always ask you to do that. Let us know where you're watching from. That means a lot to us to know where we're reaching. If you have a prayer request, go ahead and put it out there. Um, whether you want to pray, someone you want us to pray for, maybe you need prayer. When we're done, uh, we'll get come together and pray for these requests. Uh, remember my neighbor, Mary, she's in the hospital. Remember a young man named Noah Deaver. Um, a, a good young man from my hometown who's, who's struggling with uh, cancer and, and some things are going on with him. So just remember him in prayer. Pray that God heals him. And I know there's many. I get requests from all over the place. I know there's a lot of people sick. A lot of people are wondering, you know. And, and um, so let's just keep everybody in prayer. Let's go to the Word of God. I think I'm going to start. I think I'm going to start in 1 Corinthians now. 1 Corinthians chapter six verse nine first of all let me ask you a question what kind of people are gonna or go to church what kind of people make up the church what kind of people will be in heaven uh we i think one of the greatest problems of the church today and i and i'm i really believe that it's the perception that you have to get right before you go you have to be up to a standard before you walk in indoors because everybody else in there is kind of holding themselves to a standard or maybe we we may even believe that they're a higher standard but the ground is level at the cross god doesn't hold one man esteem one greater than the other christ is the only person that's ever been perfect to walk this planet and without the blood of christ none of us are righteous none of us are worthy of heaven none of us are worthy, worthy of anything of god but because of christ because of the shed blood of jesus christ we are made worthy we are justified I had a good friend of mine, Pastor Gino, Preacher Gino, he's going to, GNL Ministries be joining us in Revival, by the way. They'll be doing evangelism training every month, and they witness in the community. They, they go to the, the inner city places, and a lot of people tell them, look, I can't forgive myself. I can't go to church, or I can't get right with God because I can't forgive myself. And so he says, David, have you ever read that in the Bible where we have to forgive ourselves? And you know, that's psychology. We, we were told you got to have peace with yourself. You got to forgive yourself, right? That's what, a, that's what psychiatry will teach. That's what a lot of people, counselors say. You, got, you can't hold that guilt. You can't walk in unforgiveness of yourself. But nowhere in the Word of God do I find that I'm supposed to forgive myself. Because when I forgive myself, then I'm putting faith and confidence in my ability to claim righteousness, my ability to claim that I'm forgiven, my ability to say, you know what, I'm a good person now. I can justify that I'm, I'm, I'm worthy to forgive myself. The Bible teaches us to put all our faith and trust in Christ and Christ alone because of what Christ done on the cross, because of the shed blood that he spilt, because of my sins and yours that was put upon him on that cross justifies me, makes me holy. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody sinned, everybody. There is no perfect person that walked this planet 
uh, except for Jesus Christ. But when he hung on that cross, God made him to be my sin, made him your sin. The Bible says he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might have the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ makes me worthy. Jesus Christ makes me forgiven. Man won't forgive you sometimes. Man will bring things out of your past. I woke up this morning condemned. I woke up, woke up this morning condemning myself. I'm not worthy to stand in the woods and preach anything. I'm not worthy to do this. I'm not worthy to do that. You know, when I got tired of letting Satan beat me up, I finally started thinking, you know what, God, I am worthy because of you. You made me righteous. You made me worthy. I'm a child of the king filled with the Holy Spirit of God, more than our conqueror, our royal priesthood. I don't belong to this world. I'm not supposed to fit in. I'm not supposed to be like everybody else. I'm supposed to stand out. I'm supposed to be different. I'm supposed to be peculiar. Why? Because God put his hand on me and pulled me out of the miry clay, pulled me out of a pit, and set my feet on the solid rock and saved my everlasting soul. And so I'm here to tell you today, if you feel unforgivable, if you feel like you can't be forgiven, this word is for you. In the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, start reading in verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. And such were some of you. That's what makes up the church. It's the adulterers. It's the murderers. It's the liars. It's the thief. It's the drunk. It's the addict. That's what makes up the church of God. Because they come to the cross with all that sin. And they say, Lord, I surrender. I can't forgive myself. I can't get right. There's nothing I can do to justify it. I can't live to the standard that them people want me to live. I can't live good enough to call myself a member of such and such church. God says you can be a member of the church. You can be a member of my church. You come to the cross on level ground where God come down to earth and come up to man and says, I'll come to you. You don't come to me. I'll come to you. You know, I don't want to get sidetracked, but there's a lot of people that think, you know, I've got to get right with God to go to God. You'll never come to God unless the Holy Spirit of God comes to you first. God chose you. God looked down and says, I'm going to do something about it. We go all the way back to Genesis. Go all the way back to Adam and Eve, where this thing started. Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. They had perfect fellowship with God. And all of a sudden, because of the sin in their life, they were separated. What happened? Did Adam and Eve go looking for God? Did Adam and Eve say, hmm, you know, I need to go get right with God? No, they went and hid. That's exactly what mankind does today. When we sin, when we fall short, we run and hide. We don't want to come into the presence of a holy God because we know he's holy and we are not. But what did God do? God says, where are you, Adam? Where are you? Hallelujah. God came looking for them. And when Christ came to the cross, it was God coming to the earth and saying, I'm still looking for you today. When Christ walked the earth, he was looking for his disciples. He was looking for them to carry the gospel, to share this good news that Jesus Christ is looking for you today. You may be in your bedroom watching this. You may be in a, buying drugs and or laid up in a crack house, or maybe you're on meth, or maybe you're recovered. Maybe you're hungover. Maybe you're at Myrtle Beach. Maybe you're in Las Vegas. I don't know where you might be today, but coming by the word of God to you and saying, Christ loves you. He died for you. You are worth it to him. You are worthy for him because he made you worthy. He looked down from earth and he says, I know what she is. I know what he is, but I love him anyway. Nobody else may love him. I love him. They're mine. I want them. The Bible says all souls are mine, saith the Lord. And the souls will return to him. When we die, our spirit will return to God who gave it to us. Help me, Lord. And such were some of you. But this is what makes you the church. This is what makes you the church. But you are washed. Hallelujah. You are sanctified. Hallelujah. What does that mean? Cleaned up. Set apart. Made holy. Sanctified. But you are justified. That means I don't have to forgive myself. Psychiatrist. Counselor. God gives me my forgiveness. I can't make myself good enough. I can't give myself righteous forgiveness for my sin. But God can. And God doesn't say, I forgive you. Now go, I hope you do the best you can to make it. He says, no. 
When I forgive you, hallelujah, I come to live inside of you. I put my spirit in you because I want you to walk in power and walk in victory and not suffer through this life. But I want you to walk, no matter, I'm not talking about outward suffering now. I'm not talking about when things come against you. I'm talking about walking in authority and power, whether it be sickness, whether it be disease, financial problems, whatever it may, people coming against you, stand up for God because the spirit of God is in you today. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. You don't belong to Him. I mean, you don't belong to this world. When the Spirit of God comes to live within us, we don't belong to ourselves anymore. We're bought. Bought with a price. The shed blood of Jesus Christ. But you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body, in your spirit, which are God's. Hallelujah. Now, let me catch my breath. There's a problem today. You feel unforgivable. Now, I'm going to step out on a limb and say somebody in church has made you feel unforgivable. Somebody, your neighbors made you feel, your friends, you're not good enough. You believe the lie that the enemies told you. You believe that lie. Well, I just read to you what makes up the church of God, what makes people righteous. It's not by their good works. The Bible says it's not by works. It's by faith. It's the grace of God. Saving our soul. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, the finished work on the cross, that's it. That's what saves a man, saves a woman. That's coming to Christ in repentance. Repentance is coming to him and saying, Lord, I don't want this life anymore. I don't want this sin. It's not coming to say, well, I want to do my drugs, but I want to be right with you, God. I want to, I want to, I want to stay a drunk, but I want to get right with you, God. I'm going to stay in this adulterous fair, but I want to get right with you, God. See, that's what a lot of the churches will, will let you get by with. They'll say, well, just drop your money in the plate. Just show up. Act good on the outside. Whatever you do, don't let nobody. Don't bring a reproach against the church. Well, I'm here to tell you today, unconfessed sin, hidden sin in the darkness is a reproach against the church of God. So God won't have it. You have to come to him 100% surrendered in repentance of your sin. And that's what brings you into right relationship with God. You say, well, when I pray, I don't feel like God hears my prayers. The Bible tells us God doesn't hear a sinner. But what he does here is he hears a repentant sinner coming in faith and saying, Lord, forgive me. I believe. Why does he hear that prayer? Because the Holy Spirit of God grabs him or her and draws them to God. God is not looking to strike you down dead. God is not saying, I hate you, you're, you're, you wicked, vile sinner. If God felt that way, we would never even know God. He'd have went on about his business and let this world go to hell in a handbasket. But God loves you today. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You will go to hell because you want to go, not because God wants you to go. People say, how can a loving God throw us in hell? A loving God will never do that. A loving God will let you be condemned to hell in your own sins because you reject the finished work of Christ on the cross. There is no other way. There is no other way to salvation. Paul and Silas. Walking through the street, a woman behind them, demon-possessed. These are the men of the Most High God. These are the men of the Most High God that show us the way of salvation. He got tired of hearing it because he was bold. He knew who he was. He knew who he was in Christ. Now, in the Greek, it doesn't say they show us the way of salvation. In the Greek, it says they show us a way of salvation. And why is that significant? Because she was walking around going, hey, they're showing us a way. This is one of the ways to heaven. These guys, you know, she was she she made her the guys that owned her. She was a slave. They made a lot of money off of her because she had a gift. She she literally had a satanic, a demonic spirit that gave her the ability to tell fortunes. They made a lot of money off of her. They show us a way to God. Paul says, "That's it. I'm done." Turn around and rebuke that spirit. Didn't talk to the woman. Spoke to the spirit. Come out. There's a lot of times we think there's a lot of different ways. You're being told there's a lot of ways. You live right, do right, be the best you can. Come this way, come that way. There's only one way, and his name is Jesus. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. That means coming to the foot of that cross and confessing, repenting of your sins, and believing in him. You've never been loved like God loves you. Never. I can't explain the love that I feel in me for you and through God. I can't explain the love that I know he has for me. But it's an everlasting love. It's a love that forgives bitterness. It's a love that unforgiveness doesn't matter. It transcends that. 
someone hurting you, you can get over it. You can forgive and you can love them. Why? Because it's a supernatural love, an agape love. It's the love of God. Unforgivable. God loves you. I think about the woman at the well. <clears throat> She'd been with five husbands. And Christ said, I have to go to, I have to go where she's at. He says, I must go to Samaria. In the middle of the day, he goes to that well, that woman shows up. It was a divine appointment. It's a divine appointment today for you. The Bible says Jesus come to seek and to save the lost. He come to find you today. I'm telling you, if you come in contact with God, it's not because you found him. It's because he found you. He goes and waits at the well. She shows up looking for water. And then he says, give me a drink of water. He strikes up the conversation. See, the Holy Spirit always will come to you and he'll grab you by the heart and he'll get your attention and start speaking to your heart. And that's what Christ was doing. And then he asked her where her husband was. She said, I, I have no husband. He says, that, you've well said. I'm paraphrasing. You, you had five and one your wisdom. Not you're shacking up now. A lot of people won't go to church because you're shacking up. You're not married. <clears throat> you won't have nothing to do with God because you know you ain't living right. You won't have nothing to do with God because you've been married before. That's a big problem. Divorce. Divorce is a big problem. You know why? Because people believe, some people believe it's an unpardonable sin. I've been divorced. I was divorced before I got saved, got remarried, got born again. Everything in my past is forgiven. And divorce is not the unpardonable sin. There's only one unpardonable sin. That's blaspheming the Holy Spirit of God. And if you've done that, you wouldn't care. You would be done. The fact that God is drawing you, the fact that God is speaking to you today, means God loves you, God does not forgive, give up on you, and God wants to forgive you. You may be divorced and feel like I can't go. You may be shacked up and say, I kind of want to go to church. I'm living with this person. I've had people get send me messages. What do you think about me living with this person? What do you think about this? What, I, what does it matter what I think? What is it, what, am I, am I going to justify you or condemn you? I'm not God. What does the Bible say? That's what matters. Don't look to me. Look to the Word of God. The Bible says that we're, we're not the, that we're not, a man should be married to a woman. A man, a man and a woman should be married. And there should, you shouldn't live in adultery. You shouldn't live in fornication. It's a sinful thing. It's a sinful act. However, so is lying. So is cheating. So is lusting after a woman that walks by or a man that walks by, if you're a woman. It, adultery is something that's committed in the heart. Don't neglect coming to Christ because you're divorced. Don't, don't turn away from him because you feel unforgivable. Divorce is not an unforgivable sin, but I remember when I went to church after I was born again, I had a man tell me right to my face, you've been divorced, just pay your tithes and come to church. You're done. Don't worry about anything. Just pay your tithes and come to church. Get that now. Just pay your tithes and come to church. Second class citizen. Second class Christian. My God forgives all sin. The blood of Jesus Christ covers all sin. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Then we got those that can't get right. They're... I'm unforgivable because I can't get right. I'm an addict. I can't get over it. I keep relapsing. I keep falling into it. I get those messages too. I just can't. I can't get away from it. I'm hooked. Can't get right. Church people don't want, a lot of people don't want them there because they'll come up, they'll get right, stay right for about a month or two. They'll want some help, financial help, groceries and whatever. And they'll go back out into drugs again. They'll come back, want money, come back. I know the, I know the vicious cycle. But here's something I want to speak to church, those that are the true church. God loves them. God will set them free. And God will break them chains of addiction. It is not for you and I to neglect them. It's not for you and I to say, I've done enough. It's for you and I to do more than enough, to keep going. God done more than enough for me and you. And if they get a hold of the real thing, like the demoniac in Mark chapter 5, if, if he was bound in chains, nobody wanted anything to do with him, he couldn't get right. Nobody could help him. Jesus came to him and found him and set him free. The power of God is enough. I can't stand it when these people make excuses for God. Well, you know, they can't, they've gone too far or, or this person's been on drugs so long. And What are you talking about? We're talking about the God of glory, the God of the universe, the God that created all things, the God that, that has all power. There is nothing he cannot do. Is anything too hard for God? It's, sometimes it's too hard for us to believe God. God says no. I'm waiting for someone just to believe, and I'll show myself strong on their behalf. That person that can't get right, that you know your family member, whoever it may be, don't give up on them. Don't quit praying for them. Your prayers matter. God hears your prayers, and God will deliver them. Seek Jesus. Seek the Lord. 
Ask God to deal in their life and convict their heart. If you can't get right, if you just know you just can't get right, don't turn on, don't turn from God. Is that going to make it better? Come to Him. Come to Him just like you are. Just like the song says, just as I am. Come to Him just like you are. Say, God, I can't do it on my own. I need you. I need you to deliver me. I know a guy, a young man, <clears throat> bound by pills, delivered and set free instantly. And this young man became a preacher. Does that mean he's never tempted? Does that mean the devil doesn't always come out? Yes, the devil comes after all of us to tempt us. But God gives him the power and the grace to stand and to carry the gospel. God will make something great out of something that nobody, everybody may say that's trash. God will raise it up and make it glorious for him. Hallelujah. And then I think about <clears throat> another problem in the church, and I'm closing. They kick me out. They don't want me here. They, I'm, I, I don't fit in here. I just ain't like them. That's that's some, that's a lie the devil will tell you. You know, you're not like them. You can't be like them. You're not good. Maybe you, maybe you just don't you don't dress nice. Maybe you don't have money to buy nice clothes. Maybe uh, whatever the reason is, none of that stuff matters. None of that stuff matters. It's all a lie from hell. And Jesus found a young man that was blind one day. He'd been blind from birth. The Bible says Jesus made clay and made dirt, spit in it and put it in his eyes and told him to go and wash his eyes in the pool. Can you imagine this young man running toward that pool, been blind all his life, and here's Jesus saying, if you'll go and wash your eyes, you'll receive your sight. Can you imagine the anticipation and the excitement while he's running to that pool going, is, man, is this really going to, this is it. I'm going to be able to see. I won't have to be led by the hand. I'll, I'll know what trees look like. I'll know what, well, how the grass looks. I'll be able to see animals. I'll be able to see all kind of things. And then he watches his eyes, and all of a sudden, bam, healed, delivered, set free. Eyes opened up. But what happened? The church, the temple, the Pharisees, the religious people, not God's church, but the religious people, they didn't like it because they didn't like Jesus. See, they liked their power and control, and that's how it is in a lot of churches today. If the Holy Spirit of God showed up, a lot of the times he never shows up there, and they don't know the difference. They keep right on with their little form and fashion, denying the power thereof. They don't know the power of God. But when the power of God comes, a lot of times it upsets them. Why? Because they can't control. You cannot control God. He doesn't fit in your denominational box. He doesn't act like you. He doesn't look like you. He says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. They're higher than you can even comprehend. And they didn't like it. They didn't like the fact that he represented a miracle that Jesus Christ done. So they challenged this young man to the point where his mom and dad had to get involved. And then they turned their back on him because they knew that if anybody confessed that Christ was Lord, that they'd be excommunicated, kicked out of the temple. So they come to this young man and they said, tell us again. He told them over and over who healed, who healed him, how he was healed. Tell us again. Tell us again. You know this man was a sinner. This young man says, whether he be a sinner or not, I know. But what I do know is where I was blind, hallelujah, now I see. They kicked him out. Maybe you've been pushed out of a church. <clears throat> Maybe you've been told to leave. Maybe you just don't fit in. My friend, my brother, my sister, if you know Jesus, if you've been born again and you don't fit in where they're at, that ain't the church of God. You need to go look for another one. God's people love each other. God's people glorify Jesus Christ, not themselves, not their denomination, not their name, but God. We're left here to honor and glorify God. I'm left here to be an evangelist, to preach the gospel. That's my mission. I know what I'm supposed to do. And you have a, a mission. You have something God wants you to do. We are all working together as one body, fitly together, to glorify God. Why? To build big ministries? To be rich? To have your best day now? Why? For souls. It's all about lost souls. It's always been about that. And when we work together as children of God, souls are saved. When we stand and believe in the power of God, souls are saved. God's looking for some people to stand up and say, I'm bold enough to believe it. I'm bold enough to believe it. Like Paul and Silas, as I mentioned, are you bold enough to believe Paul was bold enough to turn around and say, come out of that woman. We in the prison for that, for that act. See, sometimes when you stand up and you're bold, you're going in a dark place. Why? Because light, darkness needs light. You're the light of the world, the salt of the earth. He called Paul. He said, I've called you. I'm going to use you. You're going to suffer many things. Paul cast a demon out of the woman. They put him in jail. 
And then they put him in the innermost part of the prison. The Bible says they put him down in the very bottom in stocks. He was laid on his back more than less. After they were beaten, whipped on their back, back looked like just mutilated, laid on the floor, the stone of the dungeon, cold, wet dungeon floor, chained and bound, backs beat, blood running, rats running around, in the center of the jail, for doing the right thing, for helping someone. <clears throat> Personally, I'd have probably been poor me. God, why do you let this happen? i done this, God, poor me. What did Paul and Silas do? They sang praises. Praise God. Hallelujah for letting me suffer for you. And they sang praises. Why, why is that so significant? God took them. They weren't in prison. The prison was come to them. God took them to the prison to be a witness, to be the light. Not only to the, to the whole prison by their singing and their suffering. They said, these guys are bold. They got something. This, they got the real thing, man. I want that. And God honored that and sent a great earthquake. The doors flew open. The, the prison guard, the man over the whole prison was about to kill himself because he thought they were all going to escape. Or maybe he thought the prison, prisoners were going to kill him. I don't know what, he's going, what was going through his mind, but I do know one thing the Bible says. He came running to Paul and him because they said, do thyself no harm. We are all here. The Bible says he ran to them, fell down and says, what must I do to be saved? If Paul had never been followed by the demonic woman, if he'd have never cast it out, if he'd have never been put in prison, that man wouldn't have been saved. And God only knows how many prisoners got saved when they saw the jailer saved. There's a purpose and a plan for our life. I'm about to take off running through these woods. I feel the power of God. There's a purpose for your life. You're not unforgivable. You got power. You walk in victory when you come by the way of the cross. God will use you mightily. You're going to walk through dark places. It's going to be dark and wicked because this world is wicked. But you are the light of the world, the salt of the earth. And God wants to use you. Our Father and God in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for what you've done here this morning. Lord, I know this is going to touch someone's heart. I know somebody's going to be delivered and set free. And God, thank you that I don't have to forgive myself that I simply find my gift, my forgiveness and justification in Jesus Christ and Him alone. And by that, I have complete forgiveness, perfect peace, no more remorse, no more sadness, no more condemnation. The enemy comes sometimes, Lord, as you well know, as a roaring lion, but hallelujah, you took his teeth at the cross. He can roar, but he can't bite. And God, I thank you that I have power in the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. And I thank you, God, for what you've done in my life. I thank you for what you're doing in people's life today. Bless them. Set them free. Break the chains. Let people know that you are the God of glory, the God of all creation, the God of power, and the God of love. And we give you all the praise and all the glory. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. <clears throat>